Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on diagnostic ultrasound. I'm Andy Thomas from Physiquip, and this session today will focus on the assessment of lower limb muscle injuries of the quadriceps, hamstring, and calf complex. So the format will be that Chris and Rob will scan, and then we're going to have a question and answer. So if you want to ask any questions, then please put it in the Q&A section on the screen. If you do have any issues with hearing or seeing anything, then please let me know and we'll address it there. So the speakers today, regular speaker, we've got Chris Myers and Rob Laus from the Sports Medicine Ultrasound Group, which is the premier musculoskeletal ultrasound education platform in the UK. And we're going to get straight into it. So Chris is going to start us off with the Soleus and the Achilles. So Chris, welcome and over to you. Uh, everybody, uh, my name is Chris Myers from Smart, as Andy said. Um, the first session we're going to look at is going to look at the calf complex. So we're going to be scanning the gastroc and soleus. I'm going to do a quick presentation on that to start with. And then we're going to look through the Achilles um, and we're going to look through all of the structures or most of the structures uh, in the calf complex. If you've got any questions, as Andy said, then just pop them onto the uh, webinar and we'll try and answer them. Um, obviously, with all COVID guidelines in place, we are keeping to them and sticking to them. So if it is a little bit fragmented, it's just that we are we're putting everything in place for you. So there's been lots of um, information about gastroc and soleus tears, particularly over the last two years. And there's three articles that I'll allude to in a minute, um, particularly by Carlos Pedra and Ramon Balios, who have done a lot of research into ultrasound and particularly soleus tears, but I think these articles have been a bit of a game changer in terms of knowing when ultrasound is useful and probably just as important when ultrasound is not useful. Um, so one thing that I would certainly take from those articles um, is that for somebody to have a significant soleus tear that will, could result in a significant period off sport or running or whatever they want to do, there doesn't have to be that specific incident. So traditionally, I would have thought that for a really big tear, they'd have had to have been running along and suddenly felt something go. Now, if they do feel that, it could be the Achilles, it could be plantaris, or it could be a medial gastroc tear. Those are the three things I would immediately think of. I wouldn't immediately think of soleus, but it could be a soleus injury. And certainly you can get these combination injuries where they have a soleus tear, a gastroc tear, and even a split of their aponeurosis, or even a partial tear of their Achilles as well. So the first learning point is you don't have to have a specific incident um, for there to be a soleus tear. However, you would normally have a specific incident if it was a plantaris rupture um, higher up in the calf, or if it was a medial gastroc tear or lateral gastroc tear, or obviously an Achilles. So, that's just something worth bearing in mind. One thing that we need to bear in mind, and whenever you're learning diagnostic ultrasound, and for those guys that already do lots of scanning, your anatomy has to be top notch. So if your anatomy is not good, you, it's always worth, worth going back to your anatomy books um, and just refreshing and look at the, almost the minutiae of the anatomy and actually, what the guys did with their Soleus research is they did just go back to the anatomy books. And what they realized is that there is an awful lot of variation in the Soleus muscle. And there's lots of reasons here as to why Soleus may be difficult to pick up um, on ultrasound. One of the things that we will try and show you in the demonstration, however, is quite tricky because there is so much anatomical variation and we've done the three of us in this room and um, we've all got different anatomy in our sleds and quite marked differences as well. So we need to be aware of the variation, but I've certainly got better at looking at soleus tears um, by picturing particularly the three areas uh, where the tenderness elements of the uh, muscle is. So that is the central tendon, which is the sub-large tendon that goes down the middle and also the medial and the lateral tendons, or some people will call them intramuscular tendons, and some people will call them the medial and lateral aponeurosis. Um, it does vary depending on what article you see, but certainly in these articles, they are referred to as the central tendon, 
and then the medial aponeurosis and the lateral aponeurosis. And as I said, there's a huge variation in this. So sometimes you don't have a central tendon. Sometimes you have a really long wide one. Sometimes you have a tendon like we're going to see on Rob, where his central tendon is to be very lateral. And it's exactly the same for the medial and lateral aponeurosis, is that sometimes you don't have them, sometimes you have a very long one. And actually on ultrasound, because of that variation, it can be quite difficult. And that's maybe one of the reasons why we don't always see them very clearly. If you want to read three articles, these are the three articles that I think have been a real game changer for particularly for soleus tears uh, for us over the last few years. The one that I'm going to draw your attention to is the middle one, um, which again has really changed our practice. It's that essentially around 30% of tears, and this is in the hands of experts who have 10 years plus of ultrasound experience, and they're also scanning on 80,000 pound machines. Now, if you don't have an 80,000 pound machine and you're not as good as these two guys, you're probably not going to get anywhere near there. So you have to be aware that ultrasound will only see around 30% of the tears that you'll see in the soleus muscle. So what does that mean for us clinically? Well, it definitely means that we have to hang our hat like we should always do on our cl clinical assessment. So actually, if you don't see a tear on ultrasound of the soleus, you certainly can't rule it out. If I don't see a tear and I'm suspicious, you do need to get an MRI. Um, and we do need to know this information because particularly in the sporting population, it can have a massive impact on the return to play. It can, it can actually double your return to play time. And often it's those injuries that a patient doesn't actually feel an incident or doesn't have an incident and feels a tear. So they haven't had an incident, they walk in without a limb and we're thinking, well, they're probably doing okay. But actually, those are the ones that can be the worst injuries because that could be a central tear of the soleus tendon, which has a long return to play. So I highly recommend that you read these. So the take home is you can't rule out a soleus tear on ultrasound. If you see it and you're confident, you can rule it in. Okay. The good news is that ultrasound is very good at looking at gastroc tears and looking at aponeurosis tears, and obviously the Achilles itself. But just be aware, and, and often the gastro tears are the ones where the patient does have a specific incident. So if you see a gastro tear, that's great, you can rule it in. If you don't see a gastro tear, potentially you can rule it out because it is quite sensitive to picking these up. Certainly, obviously things like machine, you know, how good your machine is and how good you are as an operator have a big influence on that. But generally you should be able to see a gastro tear. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is you may see a gastro tear and feel really confident that you've seen it, but actually sometimes you have a jaw injury and you have a slayer's tear. So sometimes, although you've seen the gastro injury, you need to consider there may be a deeper injury. And actually, it's that injury that may take longer to return to play. So you just need to bear that one in mind. Now, what... What we're going to try and get across in the, in the practicals and in, in this webinar is that it does make a difference regards to the location of the injury. And we all talk a lot about intramuscular tendons. And certainly when I first started scanning, or certainly when I learned anatomy, I, I really didn't understand the fact that you could have an intramuscular tendon and a pomerosis. And the way that the anatomy just continues from one portion into another, there certainly isn't that clear junction of an empty junction that goes from tendon to muscle. It's very much a transitional area, and often that tendon can still run all the way through uh, the muscle. We know that if there is a central tendon tear uh, in the soleus, then in this study uh, by Pedro, Carlos Pedro, um, who many of you know and have watched, um, that it is a significantly longer injury time and time off in terms of your return to play. But the issue is in this study, and I appreciate the numbers are low, only one of these significant injuries out of nine was actually seen on ultrasound. So we really need to bear this in mind. And there's lots of great information in there and a lot more information uh, that we're not going to present now about the injuries. But I think those are the, the key take home messages. So what we're going to do now is we're going to now just go through 
a scan of, we we'll start all the way down at the Achilles. Uh, some of it will be basic, some of it will be a little bit more advanced. And we'll try and find some of these areas, but also have a look at some of the areas around them as well. Okay, so I often will scan my patients uh, in this position with the, nice, the foot nice and relaxed. Sometimes I have a pillow underneath. But this allows me just to manipulate the foot, manipulate the big toe when I'm starting to have a look down. So what we'll do, I normally start in longitudinal section. If you guys can't see the screen when Dom zooms in, then just let Andy know and we can adjust it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, so what we can see here, hopefully you can see my button there. Okay, so what we've got here, this is the most distal element. You can see Rob's got a little emphasophite on the end of his Achilles there. That's very common. That's not anything that I would get too excited about. Just making a few adjustments here so you can see it. Great. Okay, so what we can see here is the calcaneum. Now I look very, very careful at the, uh, carefully at the shape of the calcaneum. So you can see here that the calcaneum slopes off. Now the term Haglands gets used wrongly all the time. So a Haglands, or certainly something that I would look for on ultrasound, is to look at the shape of this bone, okay? So it should be a hill. It should be down sloping. If somebody has a Haglands, then this bone is gonna be very, very straight. And obviously if that is straight, then you've got more potential for compression on the venture, on the deep surface of the Achilles. So here we can see the end thesis, which looks nice on Rob. I just want to mention about the pre-Achilles bursa or the superficial bursa, which we know is a very, very pain sensitive structure. So people that get studs down the back of their heel or if an old lady's had a, well, don't have to be an old lady, but somebody's had a shopping trolley put into the back of their heel. These are really painful injuries and often it's because they've got inflammation of the superficial bursa. Now, if I just take a little bit of pressure off and I'm just using the gel there to take the pressure off, you can see there's a compressible region just above the Achilles. And that area is the potential space for the superficial bursa. The next bursa is the deep bursa. Now the deep bursa sits in between, you can see a little darker patch here, which sits in between the cagus fat pad, which is this nice bright area, fat is always bright and it sits between there and the Achilles. So it's actually that little region in there. And obviously if you have a normal bursa, again, it's just a potential space. So you're not gonna see any fluid in there. As we go further up, you can see the Achilles. Now, Rob has very nicely run quite a few miles for us yesterday to show that he's got a little bit of thickening and you can see his tendon looks quite dark. I'll just bring this up a little bit for you. Um, so you can see the internal structure, but there is a, a small fusiform swelling, and you can certainly see some of these hypoechoic regions within the Achilles. Underneath the Achilles, all of that structure there is cagus fat pad. If we put his foot into dorsiflexion uh, and we look a bit deeper, you can see there's the tailor dome, uh, which, so this is therefore the talocrural joint, and this is the posterior capsule. If we go a bit lower, uh, this is where we're going to see an os trigonum coming off the talus. If we go back up to the Achilles, you can see Cagus fat pad underneath. If I spin into transverse section, which I suggest is probably the easiest way then to see the soleus muscle coming out from underneath the Achilles tendon. So you can see it's coming out on the medial side, which often is what it does. Um, and then as we follow it up, you can see the Achilles going further, further, further up. 
and you can see the Achilles really flattens out. I think it's absolutely remarkable how flat the Achilles becomes. You've then got your slayers underneath. Rob needs to do a few more Smith machine seated calf raises. Um, and then you've got the FHL. And if we just wiggle the toe a little bit, you can wiggle your toe, Rob, you can see FHL there very nicely. Really big muscle. I'm sure we should be doing a bit more with that from a rehab point of view. So there's Soleus and there's your Achilles. As we go further up, so if we have a look at that in long section, actually, you can see really nicely, you can see the thin layer of the Achilles. If I move into plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, you can see Soleus gliding on FHL. FHL has got this nice intramuscular tendon, if you just wiggle your toe again for us, Rob, which is just up here. And so you can see the different layers. As we go a bit further up the leg, so we're just coming up to where you would come into your musculotendinous junction. So you can see here, we've got the medial gastroc. And again, Rob, at some point in his life, probably injured his um, aponeurosis. Particularly if we go into transverse, you can see there's some thick areas, particularly on this medial side here. So this is the medial gastroc. This is Soleus and down here is FHL. So if we just have a little look here, you can see there's the aponeurosis. And if I spin on exactly that bit, then we can see that this is often what we see after an aponeurotic tear or a, um, uh, a tennis leg, as we call it. You can see the scarring up and you see that beautifully on ultrasound. The aponeurotic injuries are really nicely seen on ultrasound, and so are injuries of the medial gastroc. It's really important, if any of you have read, which I'm hopefully you have, is read Carlos Pedrec's new article on um, gastroc injuries and soleus, sorry, gastroc and aponeurotic and tendon injuries. It's really important if there is an injury to see two things. How wide is the injury? So you actually need to assess the aponeurosis in transverse section, but also, if you look at it in long section, have you still got that nice synergistic movement between the soleus below and the gastroc above? So if we just go back here now, we did try and find Rob's plantaris earlier, um, and we believe we found it. So the way I always try and find it is I just look for a little pinhead. So you can see he's got a little pinhead there. If Dom just zooms in. You can see there, and I'll show you mine in a minute, which is a little bit more impressive. Um, and also, now we talked about the um, aponeurosis in the soleus, and they are quite tough to find, but that's your medial aponeurosis of your soleus there. So that's an area to carefully assess. And I said earlier that Rob's central tendon is quite lateral, so you can see his central tendon there. Now, these are the ones not to miss. Um, and they're the ones that don't limp in, so you can miss them clinically. Um, and then as we go here, you can also see, I believe he's, Rob's just got a little lateral aponeurosis. Actually, he's got quite a long aponeurosis coming across there. So that's that hyperechoic region. I'm not sure if you can see it too clearly on there. So that just takes us through a general scan of the calf. Another area that you can see nicely is the sural nerve, which we're probably going to lose resolution there. But the sural nerve goes top there of the Achilles tendon. Okay, it's just sorry, it's a very superficial nerve, as you can see it really nicely in the fascial plane there. But I think we're losing things a bit there on the imaging. So that's just running through. I'm just going to show you another example. Dom's just going to keep it on there. So I'm just going to show you how I would find the plantaris tendon a little bit clearer. So what I would always do to find plantaris. Now, remember, everybody's got a plantaris. But I think one study showed that there's about 11 different ways it can go. But certainly if a patient has, it, certainly if they feel something pop, then it could be that they've ruptured their plantaris. I've seen a few of them or obviously their Achilles. But at the same time, um, and I'm just going to show it to you now, or obviously it could be the medial gastroc if they get a pop. So it's worth assessing the whole thing. So just what I always do is I find where the medial gastroc comes off there. Now, if you ever see a double line like that, that is the aponeurosis there, and that is a longitudinal section of plantaris. It's like a double line, a double track line, excuse me. If I go in transverse, can you see there 
it looks like a pinhead and you can follow that all the way down it will move medial onto the medial aspect of the achilles and you can just see it here because i'm scanning myself i don't know how this will go but you can see it going there you can see it going there still see it there and you can follow it all the way down medially if we go back up i just want to show you again another example of those soleus upon so that's the plantaris there okay if we then go to my soleus the way i would always do this as i've already shown you is i would go to the achilles tendon which is this nice flat band i would then come up and i see the uh, soleus coming out of here so as i go down and then i'm looking for a thick fascial band coming off the middle of the Achilles. And there you can see it. So that there is my central tendon coming off the soleus. If I go up a little bit higher, there you can see that tracking down there. Sometimes you get a little bit of a artifact from there. I'm just gonna see if I can get that a bit clearer for you. Always odd scanning yourself. There. there we go, that's a better picture. So that's my central tendon. Okay, if I go laterally, that's my lateral aponeurosis coming off here of my soleus. And then medial, when we were doing it earlier, there and there, I've got quite a long medial aponeurosis of my soleus. So you must be able to identify them. It's not clear on everybody, so don't blame yourself if you can't find them. Sometimes the central tendon is just a little short blob. Um, let me just go back to this transverse. Sometimes it's just a little short blob coming off here, but you do want to look carefully for injuries around there because those are the ones that can be very problematic. So that just gives you a rundown of the Achilles and also the calf complex. What we're going to move on, we're going to take a couple of questions just while Rob's setting up. Um, so uh, Rob's just going to set up and then he's going to go through a similar principle for the rectus femoris muscle. Thanks, Chris. So, question first. So, when would you say the optimal time to carry out a scan of a muscle tear would be? Say that again, Andy. So, when would you say the optimal time to carry out a scan of a tear would be? On ultrasound. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, what springs to mind is the one that I missed. <laughs> we always learn from our mistakes. Luckily, it wasn't worth too much money. Um, so I scanned a gastroc tear very quickly, almost within 12 hours of the injury, um, and there was no significant injury. I really couldn't see much until I saw them two days later, and there was quite a significant injury. So you should always be very careful scanning in those first 48 hours because I think you can um, you you can you can potentially miss them. So we get lots of clients to the clinic saying. I tore my calf or I tore my quad yesterday, or even if a, if a, this is one thing to definitely be aware of, if a footballer comes up to you at half time, you just bought a fancy handheld machine and you whack it out and you put your ultrasound on, on there and you go, yeah, it looks okay, You'll, you could easily, easily miss a significant injury and make yourself look a bit silly. So I would be very careful imaging on ultrasound within 48 hours. And that's because as the injury develops, it matures, the hematoma is organised, uh, or, or hematomas become more obvious, then uh, it's more likely to see the injury. Um, I think it's probably similar on MRI, but they probably do um, scan a little bit earlier on uh, on MRI. But certainly on ultrasound, I'll be very wary for those for the first four jet hours, because you can get pulled out. You can get pulled out. Okay, another question come through. Do you know the sensitivity and specificity of ultrasound scanning versus MRI on soleus tears? The best way to answer that is that the one of the three papers that I suggested goes through that in great detail. But the, the learning point for me is on, on MRI, it's very sensitive. But on ultrasound, it's definitely less so to the point that only three out of ten roughly are going to be seen on ultrasound. The point I want to make is... The MRI is gold standard, and knowing that we miss quite a few groups on the ultrasound with surveillance involvement, uh, if you have a chance on MRI, it's definitely your choice uh, of imaging, regardless of the, the 
the statistics behind it um, because you missed them. And so diagnostically, if you have a choice, MRI. That's, that's the simple answer. Okay, thank you. And one last one before we, we move on. So uh, one participant is saying that most of their scans are several weeks or months into the injury. What do you think the chances to identify tears are at that stage? What are the... Sorry, repeat again, sorry. So if someone's scanning several weeks or months into the injury, what yeah. do you think the chances are of identifying the tear then? Uh, that depends very much. I've done ultrasound scanning a lot. If, if you just go away from specific soleus, but just any muscle or intramuscular injury, uh, the healing of, of those structures varies quite a lot. And we all have sort of a generalized idea, but in, in practice it can vary a lot. Not just how long it takes for the structural healing, but also the process that, that it goes through. So what, what we sometimes see is a, a healing pattern that it, it, it starts to show that the stuff is healing, then it plateaus for quite a few weeks, nothing changes, and then it picks up again, either fibrosis or, or just degeneration. Uh, the end result can also be quite variable. You can either have a stiff fibrotic scar, sometimes the opposite, a very non-healed uh, tissue that either has a cystic formation, um, or sometimes it, it looks almost like it, it, it has a good quality in terms of flexibility and movement in its tendon as it replaces. So there's a huge variation. So the, the variable scanning it in the process of um, its healing is for the clinician to get information about the structural healing. And we all know that we have structure, function, and symptoms, and we all do our best in the clinic to test those things with our clinical tests. That is just not good enough to get a good overview. So what we can test is function in the clinic, but to see what the structure behind it is doing, you, an ultrasound or an MRI will, will help to put the two together. Now, in, in a high-performing sports person, that is very important, because you need to have as much information, because you don't want that structure to fail under the demand of that uh, sporter. So the higher the demand, the more important it is to put the function and structure together and ultrasound is just part of the image workup you can do to get structural information. That, there's still a lot of research that hasn't really got to the bottom of it. We always try to look at one or the other, the function or the structure. But it's the combination that we should really look at to get the value of. Sorry. Great, thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll move on to the quadriceps. So, Rob, over to you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to narrow it down when we do scanning to the rect fan, the proximal rect fan, the indirect and direct tendons. I just want to uh, talk to you about a few general things that we have noticed over the last years. Um, again, when Chris and I are teaching, we usually do it from a clinical perspective, and it's always important to start thinking uh, what you do with the imaging. The imaging is no more than gathering information about anatomical structures and the changes within. So what I put this slide up for is if you get close to joints, as we're going to do with a proximal rect fan, but it is equally important for the back of the knee, for the distal hamstrings um, and the shoulder. As soon as you get close to a joint, I think we have to appreciate that we can't differentiate structures as much anymore. What starts as an intra-articular problem or changes blends in with the uh, uh, structures around it. Now, to give you an example, you know, if you have a capsule around a joint and some of the labrum or meniscus, that capsule might stick and, uh, um, and interact with the tendons that are attached to it. So, you really have to see it as, as a spectrum, as an interconnected chain from an interarticular to the surrounding the marginal temporal of the joint to then the attachments that come with it. So that explains why sometimes around the proximal thigh, we get an injury that comes in the clinic and it might mimic a joint problem, whereas it actually turns out to be a muscular problem. Around the hip, there are quite a few tendons that are actually connecting to the capsule. So if that tendon is involved in the injury, it might start pulling on the capsule, but equally the other way around. In other words, we get a very confusing mixture in clinic about tests that show that there might be something in the joints, while well, actually, we also might have a look at the tendon. So it's there, and there are difficult injuries to treat, that ultrasound and the MRI can help quite a lot. MRI, of course, for the intra-articular scenario, but the ultrasound can add and work up to the peripheral margins. So what we then do with the rectus fan is that traditionally we look at the direct tendon, and we could look at that ultrasound and we could really clearly find an injury in there. 
what, what the advantages of technology has done with ultrasound is we can now also see the indirect tendon quite well with ultrasound and by being able to assess it, get more an appreciation of the interaction with and in close relation to the capsule. And so there, were, there are also some other muscles around the hip where we can have, we have the same discussion about that. So it is an example, but it also gives us a bit more insight. What you do as a clinician with the information, that's the next step and that's the exciting bit. So do not make it simple, just make, make it look, um, have a good look at the interaction between tendon, capsule and joint uh, if you're close to a joint. So briefly, if we go to the uh, rec fan, and we're going to start normally uh, about a third up from the knee and we identify the four, the four compartments uh, of, of the thigh. So we do the fastus uh, medialis, fastus lateralis, fastus intermedius and the rec fan. So once you have identified those four compartments, then you can start tracing the rec fan centrally and all the way up to the proximal uh, attachment. So what you look for um, as your landmark is that intramuscular tendon or the indirect tendon uh, that sits in, in a cross section of the rec fan um, in the muscle. Once you have your eye on it, you can trace it proximal. Now, the direct tendon forms from the anterior fascia, so it gets thickened, sits there on the top, and it will stay there. The indirect tendon will start to come close to it and it starts to blend together until close to the attachment, they separate um, to their own attachment. So here are um, a few of these pictures just to visualize that. There's some great articles that will, will uh, tell you exactly what you can do with it. There's some great articles that also tell you everything that can go wrong with it. Um, so it's, it's an important part of assessing the proximal time. Um, this, this um, what I wanted to show you is again how there have been some research to try and peel the information about these structures and carefully see what is connected to what. Most of Time it's done by surgeons because they want to know where the incision can be, do they need to do a capsule repair, or what, what do they need to do with the techniques. So, there is this uh, argument about the third head of the rec uh, cameras. It's considered to be a capsular part and it's in a different angle than the indirect tendon. For now, we're not going to scan that. Think of it more as, as part of the capsule, uh, but again, it interacts closely with the rectus femoris. Um, but there's some lovely papers and they found this structure consistently. Um, so again, it's, it's an, uh, an interesting uh, anatomy, but it's not easy to find an ultrasound. Just think of it as a connection between the tendon and the capsule. And as it happens, also very close relation to the glute minimus. I think we should have paid a bit more attention to the glute minimus. Okay. And so, um, so once more, we're going to go from the, the middle of, of the thigh, anterior bit, we identify the landmark, the indirect tendon, um, and bear in mind that the anterior fascia is the direct tendon. We trace it up proximally and we see the tendon sort of come together and form. And then we're going to go first and trace it all the way to its attachment on the AIIS, that's for the direct tendon. What we then do is show you a technique of how to visualize the indirect tendon, uh, but I'll probably do that live. So that's how we're going to show you in a minute. Okay, can I just do one more thing before we do? Because I will forget at the end, this one. Okay, so this is, this is an example where you can differentiate a little bit between direct tendon injury, indirect tendon injury. Um, this is on the left side, a longitudinal aspect of a, of a good tendon, the, the uninjured side. This is the same patient with much thickened tendon here, the direct tendon as it touches on the AIS. Um, so not an acute tear, it's just a, a big, thick tendon. It's, it's an old injury at this stage. Um, if I then do the indirect tendon, first on the healthy side, this is the indirect tendon. Uh, it's a bit oblique, that's why it's black, uh, but I've left it like that, so I'm optimizing where it comes together to the uh, direct tendon in cross-section. If we look at the opposite side, where the injury is, we again see a nice, pristine-looking indirect tendon with a capsule bit, uh, below it and we see a thickened direct tendon. So what we now know then is that the indirect tendon is actually intact and not really affected. The capsule looks good, but the direct tendon is, as an isolated injury is visible in this cross section. There's a direct tendinopathy, but without any involvement of the other structures. And again, that's quite a good thing to know because it can become quite complex when they're all are involved. 
Okay, let's go and do some scanning. Let's see if we can show you some, some ways to visualize this. If you have any questions, let, let us know. Um, I hope it's clear on the machine, so let's try. Okay. It's impressive quads there. Well, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Andy. <laughs> yeah, he didn't even shave for the occasion. Uh, a note from the probe. This is a very nice probe. It's, it's not so wide. Some of the thick radiology probes are much wider. And although that gives you a, a bigger window, so it's nice to have a landscape view, it can be quite difficult to maneuver in, in, uh, uh, in big muscles. So having a smaller footprint is actually really quite nice in this case. Um, okay. So we're going to go down towards the knee first to identify the four compartments. The medial side is on the right side and the uh, lateral side is on the left side. Uh, okay, so the bone for reference is at the bottom, the cross section of the femur. What wraps around it is the plastic intermedius. What sits on top is the rect fan and if that is the rect fan, in the, in the center, then on the medial side, there should be another compartment, which is the fastus medialis. One way to make the, 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 the fascial borders uh, clearer is simply probe. So you can see, if you push down with the probe, how the different compartments move slightly differently. So the fascial plane is actually just there. So then we go back to the middle, and then we should see on the lateral side, the lateral compartment there, with its border just there. Now, if we go up a little bit more, we do it once more, we get a bit bigger. Medial compartment, central compartment, lateral compartment, and then clusters intermedius underneath. So now we have done that and we've got all our markers. We're going to focus on the rect fan. So when we put it in the middle of our screen, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. And then we're going to slowly move upwards, approximately. And we're looking for the intramuscular tendon or the indirect tendon as it will start to come up. Okay, now, as you can see, this, the, it starts to look here. Because it's, it's a, an oblique structure, one good tip is try to get this a bit more aligned with your probe, and it starts to show much, much better. And it, and it means you to put the probe uh, pointed down a little bit to make it flat. And that's quite nice. And it's quite important, because if you do it in, in this setting where you can't see it, how are you going to make call on any injuries around this area, which is a very common area. So flatten it out helps and you can see the, the tendon much better because when the tendon is involved in the injury, that's when we're in trouble. So you don't want to miss that out. Uh, sometimes it can be just the muscles attached to it or a combination of the tendon and the muscle. So really make yourself comfortable with moving the probe and this is the tendon. So once you have your eye on it and you have closely looked at it, you just follow it up approximately. Keep it nicely in the middle. You can stop at any stage Maneuver around, make it look, investigate it around the whole area. We can, we're going to follow it up. Slowly, this tendon will get more superficial and it will start to go into the corner. Here it comes, into the corner here. So here's the, here's the tendon again. And I'm going to make it a little, little, little deeper. So we're going to make it a little bit more into the corner there. So where I was coming from was here, and as we go more proximal, it starts to sit in the corner. There's still the muscle next to it, but it now becomes more um, um, superficial, and it sits in the corner. Now we're going to follow it all the way through, so now it's nicely formed, and then we're going to continue. So th this here is a combination of the indirect and the direct coming together. Now here, we have to just point out that you get this black shadow underneath it. And that black shadow is, is a reflection from the indirect tendon. We're going to ignore that for the moment because we're going to trace the tendon itself to the attachment of the AIIS, which is coming up here. So you just keep going until you find the nice attachment on it. Okay, now once you have that, we can, you can spin on it. 
And you look for, as with any attachment, you look for bony irregularities and erosions, thickening of the tendon. If the tendon is really ruptured, you often find it retracts. And then we can follow it. So I just hold it closely. Hold on. Let me just get a little bit closer there. We can follow it sort of up so to the um, to the distal part there. And it gets it becomes the anterior or superficial uh, fas fascia there. So that it goes into that. So you can take your time, do it slowly, follow it back again to the attachment, and then you back on the bone coming up, coming up there. Also, uh, have a look deeper down. You can see the joint. This is the hip joint and the capsule on top. And again, as I was saying, the close relationship between the proximal uh, tendon and the joint is, is more than we appreciate, I think. But you can have a look at that and see if there's any changes in that. And now we go back to the top. So where we were here, we're going to go in cross section. And now we're going to drop off. And so now we're back in that, in that area just when we go distally from the bone where you get a darker shadow. And it's there that we need to try and see if we can find a good picture on the indirect tendon. So to do that, we push down on the, on the lateral side and then we just try to flatten it out as much as we can. You can see it looks dark here on, on, the, on the left bottom. That's because it's still a bit oblique. So the more I can line it up, the better we can see the fibers. So what we now have is a picture where we get the indirect tendon where the cursor is, and we can trace it a little bit up, and then the cup shield is underneath it at the bottom there. That's the indirect tendon. Rob, could you just show us your probe, the position now, please? Yeah. So, you okay with that? So if, if I just don't look on the screen, but have, but show you how to change the probe position, you go from here, and if, if you could see what I'm doing with the lateral side of the probe, I need to push it in a little bit and then slide the lateral as well, and then adjust it a little bit to get the, the optimum picture on there. So it is really a, a matter of pushing that lateral side in and then lateral as well. Take your time on it, um, and it is, of course, important to just screen through it, okay? So that's the way to, to find it. And with machines like this, it's, 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 it's quite good. You can see nice detail. Okay. Okay. Any more questions, Andy? Yeah, we do. So straight into it. In terms of frequency, what would you suggest for the quadriceps? Um, as, as with any structure, you need to get it as you need to get it as high as you can get away with without uh, being too superficial. If you go quite low, and low being if you, if you go lower than seven and a half megahertz, you already start to see less detail. So with, with, with this uh, with this structure, when we are doing proximal scanning, it's about two and a half centimeters down. So it, it is not the most difficult one to do. So you can probably get away with seven and a half or higher. You don't really want to drop the frequency unnecessarily. If you go really into the middle of the thigh and you talk about six centimeters down, especially if you have a football player or a rugby player, you will have to drop the, the frequency. Uh, most machines will adjust a little bit. If you, if, you, if you adjust your depth, it will also adjust the frequency for you to optimize your picture. But the general rule is you normally try to uh, minimize the drop in frequency because it also will lose your, um, um, your detail. And again, it, it, it comes down to the machine and the operator to, to see what you can do to optimize that. Um, in general terms, I must say that um, the MSK probes, as well as the, the ultrasound machines, have got a lot better over the last years, but they still need to do a better job, as we just discussed with the soleus, but also the deep thigh, the adductors. Um, those deep structures are not easy to get a really good picture on with a normal MSK probe, and that includes uh, uh, curved probe because the curved probe do drop that frequency. So, so we saw room for improvement. And what is the muscle superficial to the rec fem as you track proximally? Um, what's the muscle superficial to rec fem? Depends where you are. Probably TFL. Yeah, but it depends. Yeah. Exactly. If not, it could be Sartorius coming around, but probably TFL. Yeah, best we can on that we're talking. Yeah, okay. 
Any other questions, Andy, or do you want us to go on to the hamstring? We'll ask one more as well. So how important is the location of the muscle tear? How important is the location? I think, I think that's the, the whole point, really, of what we're trying to get across today, is that it is really important. Um, and every muscle injury is slightly different, um, whether it involves the tendon, whether it's purely myofascial, whether there's a combination of the tendon plus the muscle. And then what Rob's really getting at there with the indirect um, head of rec fem is actually the relationship to the capsule and the joint itself. And, and I think across the board, we, we very much oversimplify injuries. Um, and so I think it's very important that we go back to the anatomy and we have a look at it in really looking at the minutiae detail and to when we talk about something being a tear of the rec fem, we need to do much better than that. We need to know, does it involve the anterior fascia, which is the direct head of rec fem? Does it involve the, 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 the central tendon or the indirect head, which goes onto the acetabulum? Does it involve just the muscles? Which part of the muscle does it involve? Does it involve the intramuscular fascia? So I think we have to be very you know, cautious of oversimplifying our diagnosis. Now, for those that don't image or maybe think that imaging gives not too much detail, but maybe doesn't give us um, relevant information, well, there is an argument for that. But I think if we could start with a really good comprehensive diagnosis, i.e. we start with as much information as we can about that injury, then it will start to make sense. And, and if you think that you've got a rec fem tear, well, actually, why have you got a positive favours? Why have you got a positive femoracetic impingement test as well as that? So we need to take it to the next depth because that is the bit that may prolong those injuries. And we've got to have those at the back of our head right from the beginning. And if things aren't going in the right, right direction, then it's really important to consider those things. Yeah, I want to add to that as well. A very simple example, when you see loads of studies for missed Achilles tendinopathy, and then if you realize it and appreciate that the variation in, in the distal soleus, where does the first spinal soleus start, can vary a lot. And a lot of people get diagnosed and treated for, and lovely rehab programs for missed tendon uh, Achilles tendinopathy, when in reality, the injury extends to the muscular tendons junction with the soleus. Now that's a totally different kettle of fish. That is a muscle and a tendon interaction, no longer a mixed tendon problem. And it's a very simple anatomical uh, feature that if you highlight it and you're aware of it and you know it from the beginning, your responsibility as a clinician is to take it to the next level and come up with a differentiation in your protocol and not just treat mixed tendon tendinopathy when half the time it's a MTJ of the soleus. And that's an example in a very simplistic way why it's important that location is taken into account from the start. What you do with it, that is the challenge. And what we highlighted with the hip is that there's still a lot of challenges ahead of us. But if we ignore it or not even recognize, that is, I think, where we simplify and generalize too long and too much. Okay, we're going to go on to the hamstring, and Rob's going to take us through how to do the proximal hamstring. Um, the key thing about the hamstring um, is that there's not, there's not many bones around there. So we've got to find soft tissue landmarks. And I think when you orientate yourself, and Rob will take us through that, it's really important to remember these landmarks that we teach people to ensure that not only you're on the right area, um, but also you know exactly which part of that muscle or tendon you're on. And do be aware of the anatomy, as we've already sort of considered with the soleus, varies massively. So for example, at the proximal hamstring, you may have a very long tendon for semimembranosis, and the semimembranosis muscle may not actually start to a long way down the thigh, or in some people, it could actually start right up at the ischium tuberosity. So when we're looking for our landmarks, Rob's gonna go through it. This is the first thing we're gonna look for, is that semimembranosis muscle belly, and look carefully at the shape of it. It's a triangle, so we need to find that triangle on ultrasound. We're also going to identify what we call the tadpole, which is the tendon of semimembranosis. It's a pretty cool bit of anatomy. Semimembranosis muscle belly is there, the tendon is all the way over there, not to be confused with the sciatic nerve. 
On top of the semimembranosus tendon, you've got the really big semitendinosus, sorry, semimembranosus tendons, the semitendinosus muscle belly, which starts very close to the ischial tuberosity. And that has an intramuscular tendon or a raphe or raphe, depending on which part of the world you're from, that runs through it. And that forms a lovely soft tissue landmark. And then we know we're on the biceps vein because we've got the sciatic nerve underneath it. And we also can then identify the conjoint tendon, which sits nicely in between the two muscles that feed into it, which is the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris. Because some of the people that we teach forget that this is not the sciatic nerve. So what we do is we teach everyone to start either on the lateral side or the medial side and follow the functional plane so you know what structures you encounter and you never get it wrong, especially when people have had injuries in the past and you get fibrosis where it's not as clear what structure you're looking at. So we can start on the medial side and we we'll trace it up from there. Okay, so to, to start, we're looking for those landmarks, which is basically just below the crease of your buttock. So we're going to start there. Uh, Meteor is on the right side of the picture. I'm going to make it slightly right, so that's okay. So still, yeah. Okay, so we're somewhere. We're not sure yet. So we're going to go a little bit medial. And we're going to follow what is the fascial plane here. And as we go medially, you can see the pointy bit here of that uh, compartment. So everything further medial is adductor, this is adductor magnus, and this is its little tendon here in the, in the corner as a little uh, landmark. Now, if we are in the medial compartment and we, we don't see yet that triangle area where the semimembranosus muscle is, all we need to do is go distally and expect and basically confirm, hopefully, that that is where the semimembranosus then starts its muscle belly and it starts to come out there. So if we go back proximal, you can see this disappear. Distally, it comes out. Probing, pushing your probe down a bit helps a little bit. If you see how these two compartments are definitely some different muscle bellies. Um, so you start here, that is just one compartment, and then come up here and you can see the same membranose is lovely sort of forming its muscle belly. So we've confirmed that and we know exactly where we are. And we follow the fascial plane back to the center. There we go. And then here's the little tadpole that we spoke about, that is the tendon of the semimembranosus. Again, pushing a little bit helps, trying to keep the fascia parallel to your probe. If you do it more diagonally or angle it wrong, you might not see it at all. It just disappears in the fascial tissue. So angle your probe properly and try to get that fascial plane nice and flat. Okay. Then we continue, fascial plane, and then we see a big nodule there. That is the next one, this is the sciatic nerve. And if that's the case, then we normally have a good view on the uh, the, the biceps and the semitendinosus tendon, the conjoint tendon there on top. There it is. And then if we go follow it further to the lateral side, we see the end of that compartment, which is then basically the end of the biceps, which is all here, the long head of the biceps. So we've got all those structures now confirmed. Conjoint tendon, sciatic nerve, and here on the, on the far end sits the um, semimembranosus. As Chris was saying, here you've got the rafa, in the semitendinosus. So again, helps us nicely to uh, confirm and identify the semitendinosus if we hadn't already um, confirmed that. So once you have seen all those structures, you can individually uh, follow them. And we can try to do that going upwards. We can try to look down. You can take the sciatic nerve and follow it. Um, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to try and see if we can follow the structures proximally. That is sometimes quite hard work because A, to visualize all those structures together and B, to really uh, angle it so you can follow it till its insertion. So here we see the conjoint tendon. I like to see where the, uh, the semitendinosus tendon is on the inside, on the medial side. Uh, we go, there it is. And now we're going to go proximally. Now the tendons should start to move slowly together. So it's getting closer together. And the semimembranosus will be deeper to the conjoint tendon. There they are. Then they're getting closer. Now we're getting very close to the attachments. I have to work hard. That gets a little difficult to see now in, in, in no man's land there. They are just under each other there. And if I continue, we're hitting the bone. Now, 
the way I'm hitting the bone at the moment is quite oblique. So we can try to flatten out the curve and then we can see the tendon attachment a bit better on top. And then if you go a bit lateral to that, you see the, the sciatic nerve in the fascial plane and perhaps tremors underneath it for your reference. And then here again, we are at the attachment of the hamstring. So when we then spin on it, we see on the lateral side a nice thick tendon there. Tell me, hold on. This is the medial side. So there's a muscle belly and then a very short tendon. That's the conjoint tendon. And if it goes slightly more lateral, then it becomes more of a thick, not a great stitching, as good as, yeah, there, a thick tendon, which is more the same membranosis. So they're sitting quite close, of course, to each other, but that's how you can differentiate them. The conjoint tendon has a little muscle belly, muscle belly next to it. So we can do it that way and get a good uh, view on it. It's hard work. It's still sometimes necessary to look at the MRI scan because a lot of things can go on there at the attachment um, that, that go beyond what an ultrasound can pick up. But it's certainly worth having a good initial look to see if there's any, uh, anything wrong with the tendons. So that's how you do it. You identify uh, the structures first, and then you can trace them up or down or pick any interesting structure to follow. And it works quite well with, like I said, the small probe, some thick probes can be quite hard because it's really difficult to get your position right. Okay. The other thing just to mention, um, we zoom in on the presentation. Just the last tendon to consider is the adductor magnus. So if we just zoom in on this first one, you can see what we've identified is the triangle, which is the most medial. If you just follow that fascial plane along, if you just follow the fascial plane along, then everything underneath there is adductor magnus. It is a huge muscle. The adductor magnus has a little tendon that you can follow all the way up to the medial aspect, aspect of the ischial tuberosity. So we often talk about three muscles going into the, uh, or three tendons, sorry, three muscles, two tendons, the conjoint and the semimembranosus going into the ischial tuberosity. But don't forget, most immediately, we also have the adductor magnus attachment that also goes into the ischial tuberosity. And you, it's tricky, and you definitely go into areas you don't necessarily want to go into, but you do end up finding that onto the medial aspect of the ischial tuberosity. Cool. Okay, thank you for that. So, have you ever found that a pillow under the front of the pelvis of the patient useful to assess that muscle complex? Pillow under the front of the patient. Has that made it easier? Yeah, all this. Um, to put them into a bit of hip flexion. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Uh -huh. I think I think with any any of you know essentially if you get if you're happy with the image that you get, you don't need to do anything like that. If you're struggling, that may be something that you want to try to try and improve your image quality. But there's no doubt that operator, but also the quality of the machine. Uh, it's always worth dropping your frequency for the proximal hamstrings. You can also use a uh, curvy linear probe, or you can also get the virtual convex on some machines that can help with that. But in terms of position for the patient, as long as they are comfortable, you're comfortable. I've, I've scanned them on their side with the 90 degree uh, flexion in the hip. Again, just depends what angle you, you need to get that information, uh, and as long as the patient is comfortable with it as well. Cool. Yeah, we had also had a comment from the, the previous scan saying that they cross uh, the leg, they scan over one foot over the other foot to optimize yeah. the picture of the indirect yeah. tendon. Yeah, so, so that is a that is an absolutely reasonable way to do it. It's how I started to do it. I think in 99% of cases, it is completely not necessary. You've just got to, as Rob rightly said, you end up over here. So you, as well, if you're if you're in neutral, you are very very lateral. If you put your leg across, which is absolutely fine to do, then you're going to be less lateral. You can get a good image. But again, it's 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 personal preference, and for that patient that you're struggling to get that image on, then you may need to use it. But I I rec certainly from my own experience, I do scan this area a lot as Rob does, and, and we generally can find it just at a super position. I, I've discussed this with, with uh, some of the people who made the articles that we all read, and they said it doesn't really matter as long as you can indeed get to where you want to go. Sometimes when you cross the leg, it gets much tighter, and it's not as easy to get a good probe position for yourself.
So vary it, find out what works best, and sometimes what patient works works uh, well with that technique. Uh, but there's no no set way to do it. Okay, just a closing question for you both. You've both touched on this, but how good would you say that ultrasound is at monitoring and guiding return to play? I mean, we might need another hour for that one. <laughs> I think uh, the principle is your clinical assessment is still going to be your most important thing. I always say you hang your hat on the clinical assessment. However, things like soleus tears, you can, you, they can jump, they can jog, they can do everything you want them to do in the clinic. However, you look at it on ultrasound and it can still look a bit of a mess. And it's a really difficult thing to say or know, but often the ultrasound may slow me down with those patients despite them looking functionally okay. Just because I know the risk is quite high and it's the same when you have the tendon issues in the red bend, the, the risk is slightly higher. So the other reason I use it for monitoring um, is if there's a hematoma, I will use it to potentially want to aspirate the hematoma, but I will use it to monitor the healing. And it sometimes correlates really nicely with your clinical assessment, and sometimes they're pushing on really quickly, but they still essentially have a hole in that aponeurosis or the muscle, and those are the ones you may decide to hold back. So. I think it's. I think there's a. I think in the future we're going to know a lot more about monitoring on ultrasound. Whether it's going to be that they correlate or whether they're not, I'm not sure. But I, I, as a physiotherapist, I see the role. Not with all of my patients, but there's been a few patients where I'd say that role has been quite key. And it's also very useful for getting the patient to understand the healing and what stage they're at, which can either help to push them on and reassure them, or hold them back. Um, I like to say that. If you have a high performance patient with a high that level, that was a pro, yeah. <laughs> with, a, with a high level, if you have a high level performance patient, they they need to be uh, maybe monitored a bit better. Meaning, it's it's the information that you gather and then what you do as the clinician there to combine it. If you don't look for the information, you And if it's a high level performer, it, it might make quite a bit of difference. If it's someone who just walks the dog twice a day for ten minutes, they might get away with a lot more and we never really worry about the difference between the structure and the function but those high performers you may want to know what that structure is up because it might give you slightly risk assessment as Chris is saying or not but not having that information never gets you any closer to understand why some of them might not behave the way you think it's just we we're, we're constantly having to evaluate what we do with our information but it has to start with a diagnostic information gathering and build up everything around it and your clinical skills most of the time when people say, do we need the image, people always throw them back and say, do we need to do clinical tests? They can be as blunt, non-specific, or generalized as anything else. Yet we often guide ourselves by those, not by the imaging. And the imaging on their own may not give it. You really need to combine it, but just don't throw it out. Mix it up and use it to your best uh, uh, ability. And that's always going to be a challenge. So the future, I think, is that we get more information and that we more blend it together and we get better as a condition with our tests and functional tests and, and our rehab programs specifically for that injury and for that patient's demand, as well as the imaging shows us much more detail to differentiate further and understand why some of the injuries that we think we know what happens, we might have to change our mind about. And I'm always surprised about the Achilles standard, a big structure, how over the years we're still looking for answers. And so it's, it's, it's a constant journey. And the hamstring has been for 20 years as I've been pulling with ultrasound, not, not any different. Uh, I think it's more exciting. Don't be, don't be uh, discouraged by uh, thinking everything has to be explained. If everything is explained in your mind, you generalize it and you're not looking for, you're not curious enough as a clinician. Okay, yes. great. Very last question. Can you re recommend any muscul muscle architecture anatomy resources? Uh, the best way of learning anatomy is to do it, is to start scanning. I oh, think well. that's really good. But it, there's so many good anatomy reviews um, out there. I, but when I started, a lot of research was done by combining surgical uh, with um, MRI, ultrasound, and sometimes some cadaver specimens. So if you have if you have interest in getting to the nitty gritty, then those type of uh, research papers are really good. They're usually done for surgical purposes 
um, but more and more also thought of sound like Carlos um, and, and his colleagues in Spain, they do really sport specific research, but they do put the imaging together with uh, the anatomy and the function. So there's a lot that you can you can pick up from the internet. Um, cross-sectional anatomy, I when I taught it myself, MRI cross-sections are very good because we're looking often at cross-sections. So having a cross-sectional image in your head or what you look at is a good starting point and MRI is really good for that. Uh, and I agree, I mean, telemeric anatomy slides are, are really good and there's lots of articles that they correlate that into the ultrasound. But again, when you look at, I think the medial deltoid is a really good example of where actually if you look at it in real life, it's just one big mash or mesh. But actually what we've done from an anatomy point of view for learning and for understanding is we've simplified them into these different bands that are partly made up and there's some great articles out there on that. But anyway, I think we've been going on a little bit over an hour, Andy, so if there isn't any burning questions. Um, people can get more information. All of our courses are still on. Um, who knows what's going to happen in a few months, but um, our website is ultrasoundtraining.co.uk. Um, so have a look at the different courses. If you go to the resources section on there, um, there's lots of information there about um, uh, lots of different things, different machines, etc. Um, and we've just also got a, a smug uh, YouTube channel, uh, and that's what we've been doing today. Uh, we wanted to film a two-minute video series. Um, so just two minutes of each area with lots of landmarks, um, and hopefully they, those videos are just a representation of how we teach on our courses. Cool. Anything else, Andy, or should we leave it at that? No, I think that's everything from our side. We just want to mention a couple of things that we've got coming up. So firstly, thanks to Chris and Rob for, for their time on that. That was really, really interesting. So if anyone is looking at products, we can support with that. So we've got one which is on Thursday next week. If you're looking for a system, we can talk you through that. And then we've also got one with um, hopefully Rob and Chris again, and we're going to be looking at the upper limb. So basically keep posted, look on all of our social media at Physiquip. We will send you a follow-up email on this with some feedback. So we'd love to get that from you. But other than that, thank you very much for joining. Thank, big thank you to Chris and Rob. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks for having us. Thank you.